back to um, a little bit of physics. The um, laws, are, I was not the, you know, like a Monday's lecture was probably one I'd rather we didn't have recorded, but uh, it, it is recorded. And then, you know, so um, the, the idea was, that, of course, that I started off with all the facts about laws of reflection and refraction. And you saw, because it took about 27 equations from start to finish, that actually calculating this reflection coefficient for light that was polarised perpendicular to the plane of incidence was, was quite a job. And uh, I should say I've set a weekly problem on that, but it's assuming that you've got to the stage where you've already proved that um, the <coughs> angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And in particular, we saw that that implied that Kx and Kx prime had to be the same. You've, we've already proved Snell's law, and the idea is given all that, and then given the, um, f what follows from Maxwell's equations at the interface, we know, we looked at this, it's, it's relatively clear that the, from continuity of the equations at the interface, we've got that relation. That comes quite immediately from the continuity of the electric field. And I mentioned that it comes from the continuity of the magnetic field. This is proved in the Feynman that uh, you have to have also this relationship. So given these and these and Snell's law, uh, you're asked to uh, prove that... The, so if you like, it's the final algebraic steps of the proof. Now, you, you know, it took almost two lectures to get to equation 19.3, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing with equation 19.4. It's a similar argument for parallel polarised light, but in fact the algebra is even a little bit more involved. So we'll, we'll just uh, leave that one. Um, you know, if you proved it for one of the cases, it's, it's only uh, extra algebra to prove it for the other. There was one thing that um, um, I, I would like to mention about that, and that is that some people, so in, not surprisingly, find it a bit difficult at first sight to see that these two reflection coefficients reduce to this for normal incidence. In other words, when the ray just hits the surface, some of it is reflected and some of it goes straight on into the medium. And um, the easiest way to prove this, rather than taking limits of these expressions, obviously here, as theta i tends to theta t, you, uh, you, you seem to be, uh, I, I, if they're both, if you like, zero, you've got zero minus zero over zero plus zero, and of course you've got one of those uh, situations where you've got a zero over zero. You could take the limits of that carefully, but actually it's easier to use an intermediate step in the proof. And this indeed will be part of the sort of proof of the... Um, in, in the uh, calculation that I set for the coursework, is that before we uh, use Snell's law to eliminate one of the refractive indices, remember we use Snell's law to eliminate N2 and then N1 cancelled in the numerator and denominator, is actually from that intermediate step of the calculation, which was equation 19.5, you can see that if theta i is theta t is naught, this immediately, well, the cosine of naught is 1, just becomes n1 minus n2 over n1 plus n2. And then again, always a crucial step if you're calculating irradiance or intensity. The intensity is proportional to the square of the electric field vector, and therefore you get this equation n1 minus n2 squared. So that's a kind of footnote on the calculations we did. Well, after doing all that work, um, this is what the reflection coefficients look like, plotted as a function of theta. And uh, this is, again, plotted for the air-glass interface. So you can see there, that is about 0.04. You can immediately tell we're going to get that from, if I just uh, use this here, if you've got n1 minus n2 over n1 plus n2 squared for normal incidence, well, if you've got glass, you've got 1.5 minus 1 over 1.5 plus 1 squared, which is 0.5 over 2.5 squared, which is a fifth squared, which is a 25th, which is 0.04. So this is actually, you've got to choose some refractive indices to make a definite plot. 
and this is done for the air-glass interface. Of course, the reflection coefficients at the other end tend to 1, because as the angle of incidence approaches 90 degrees, you imagine at 90 degrees, you're actually just kind of skimming the surface, so none of the ray goes into the, into the, into the glass at all. Uh, but it's a very noticeable feature of this, is that although our perpendicular is a, uh, just a function that <coughs> de increases from naught to one smoothly, there's actually a zero in our parallel. And that's a very uh, obvious feature of this plot. And I must say, my apologies, this is the one time uh, that one of the diagrams in the course handout is actually really misleading. I took this from a, a book and only noticed it later and didn't have time to sort of put it back together. This so-called Brewster's angle, where you basically um, get a linearly reflected, uh, the, the, the beam is polarised because if you, even if you shine white light on the surface, none of the light with parallel polarisation gets reflected at this Brewster angle, which is about 56 or 57 degrees for, for air glass. But that specifically occurs when there's a right angle, not as drawn on this uh, sketch, where there's a right angle between the, the, the reflected beam and the transmitted beam. And if you look at that in a, a, a better diagram, this is the one that I wish I, I had used, uh, it becomes, I think, clear why that's actually the case physically. Because if you have, you, you know, like we used, the whole idea of that long calculation was that at this point, the three waves are the same wave. So we've got these exactly what are called conditions of continuity of Maxwell's equations at the boundary was precisely what enabled us to calculate the coefficients. And so if the, remember always, uh, this is represent the circles representing the oscillations perpendicular to the plane of the, uh, the view graph here. And imagine we've got an unpolarised beam. In other words, it's got components in both senses. Well, here... At this angle, if you're in the plane, let's say, let's just concentrate on the in-plane oscillation of the electric field. In this wave, the in-plane oscillation, of course, it's Maxwell's equations. It has to be perpendicular to the K vector. We know that from, from our basic solutions of the Maxwell equations. But this is the same wave at this point, and you can see that if you were to have a polarisation in that sense at that point, it would be along the direction of the, reflect, of the reflected ray. So that is forbidden by the Maxwell equations. So the reflected ray has none of this in-plane component because the in-plane component would have to be along the k-vector. And so it would uh, contravene the basic solutions to Maxwell's equations. So the reflected ray, if you start with unpolarised light and hit it on the surface, all of the in-plane polarisation travels into the medium and the reflected ray is then po polarised. And that was, in fact, that at the beginning, that was the only way people could produce polarised light. Chemists have now discovered this much more clever way of doing it with, uh, with polarisers, with Polaroid, which uh, I'll come to. Incidentally, too... There we go. Okay. Bit glary in here. That's precisely how sunglasses work. Is that if you want to cut out, if you want to actually see, I mean, they're good sunglasses, of course, are the ones that have got so called, po they're called Polaroids, polarizing uh, lenses in them, because reflected glare, if you've got reflection off surfaces, it's polarized. So if, you, if you're looking uh, at, at, at an unpolarised light source, the reflected glare is polarised, and then you have polarising lenses that, take, that cut out the reflected glare. So this has you know, got a very simple application, is that because reflected rays have got this tendency to be polarised, then um, polarising lenses take the, um, the glare away. So I'll make a few... Uh, quick board notes on that um, and in particular I'd just like to draw your attention to this calculation at the bottom here which I, I'll go through on the board as well is it's very easy to calculate the Brewster angle 
because once you've appreciated that there has to be a right angle between the reflected ray and the transmitted ray, then in the, uh, I'm sorry, it's given as theta p on this view, view graph, it's given as theta b in the VLE notes, and I'll, I'll, I'll put it as theta b because it's easier to remember, I think, Brewster's angle. The p, of course, is for the polarising angle. Well, if you've got this right angle here and you just look at Snell's law, then N1 sine theta p has got to be equal to N2 sine of 90 minus theta p. But the sine of 90 minus theta p is just the cosine, and therefore that you get that the ratio of the sine to the cosine, which is obviously the tangent, is equal to this ratio cross-multiplying this equation to N2 over N1. So the Brewster angle is precisely the angle whose tangent is N2 over N1. And if you look up the angle whose tangent is 1.5, you get about 56 degrees. So um, this is the, uh, the only equation, I think, of this lecture. So after the diet of relentless equations when we were, we were deriving things, this is... Um, this is quite uh, an, an easy one. So <coughs> the reflection coefficients and again I think it's very you know, satisfying to have derived them from the Maxwell equations because these were completely uh, unthought of if you like and, and, and uh, in order you know, to have a, a, and this was one of the reasons Maxwell's theory gained great acceptance, was the quantitative accuracy of these predictions and, the, and indeed the understanding of what polarisation really is. So the reflection coefficients are plotted against theta i, the angle of incidence, in figure 86. So this is the, oh, have we got? Maybe a bit more light. It seems a bit dark there. There we go. That's a bit better. Um, and they're just, uh, you, although you can derive them, of course, they're facts. And a noteworthy feature, it's an obvious feature of this, is that R parallel, this is the reflection coefficient for the light with the electric field vector in the plane of, of, of incidence and reflection goes to zero at an angle theta b. So yeah, sorry, I, I, I used theta p for polarising angle on the view graph, but as I've used theta b on the VLE notes, um, I'll stick to theta b on the board notes, um, known as uh, theta b, known as Brewster's angle, Again, of course, after the scientists who uh, discovered this, known as Brewster's angle, uh, for which theta i plus theta t is 90 degrees. And at this particular geometry, oops, somebody's not cleaned this board. I just use one of the ones over here. So the. Uh, it's a ve then it's a very simple application of Snell's law, applying Snell's law. Very easy little piece of maths in this lecture compared with the last one. Well, n1 sine theta b, that's the product of the refractive index with the sine of the angle of incidence, is equal to n2 sine 90 minus theta b. This is N2 times the sine of the angle of transmission. So Snell's law is just straightforwardly applied. Well, this is just N2 cos theta b. And cross-multiplying, we get the very easy expression that sine theta b over the tan... Oh, excuse me, getting ahead of myself, over cos theta b, which is, of course, tan theta b, is equal to N2 over N1. So if you know the ratio, and almost always, rather than... I mean, you can, you can set little tricky problems where you go from water to glass and so on, but uh, quite honestly, it, almost all opti real optics problems, we're, we're, we're in, particularly in the light regime, we're interested in um, going from air to glass. And air is... 
Air has not quite got the refractive index of a vacuum, but it's 1.00001, something like that. So it's effectively one. And uh, so you can think of it, if you like, as just if you're going from air, it's just that the, the, the tangent is equal to the refractive index of the medium. Or if you prefer arctan, theta b. <coughs> Sorry, let's put it, excuse me, theta b is the angle whose tangent is the ratio of the refractive indices. And I'll mention this here explicitly because the, um, the coarse handout has got a really poor diagram because the angle on the coarse diagram is not a right angle. Uh, this was a good diagram that I took from another book. Uh, this is a really poor illustration of uh, Brewster's angle because you can see that is, you know, in the sketch is not a right angle. So I'll just mention that uh, the situation is illustrated badly in figure 87. Figure 87 is one. Yeah, you might want to get a red pen on like I did and actually make the, the angle to um, a right angle. So um, that was, because of this, this property of getting um, uh, reflected rays at a particular angle from a surface, was the only known way of producing polarised light. Uh, but the chemists have des designed a very clever way of doing it. And uh, I'll just... Um, again, that's illustrated very, very uh, schematically in figure 88. And um, when you um, send an unpolarized beam, and again, remember always in this we're just representing the electric field vector. It gets too complicated to try and represent all the waves. All these diagrams like figure 88 and so on are showing the electric field vector. You pass it through a piece of Polaroid and whoops, as if by magic, only the um, a particular polarization uh, called the axis of polarization passes through. Now, what is being done there at a kind of molecular level is that you can imagine, let's say that we've got, sent, you know, remember all this stuff applies to all electromagnetic waves, and let's say we've got some electromagnetic waves with a wavelength of about a centimetre. Yeah, that's a perfectly good solution to Maxwell's equations. And we just have like a little grid of wires with the separation of the wires about a centimetre. So what would happen if we sent through um, an electric wave with its um, E vector oscillating in this sense and a grid of wires in this sense. Well, the wave would basically just pass straight through the grid of wires because the electric field uh, can drive electrons uh, only in this sense and, and the whole thing is contained in thin wires. So a grid like this can't absorb the energy and the, the, the wave just passes straight through. But if I turn the grid through 90 degrees and all the wires are... Again, imagine now these are kind of like about a centimetre apart and this wavelength is of the order of centimetres. Well, now, as this electric wave hits this, it drives the electrons up and down the wires and, of course, they can respond to that. The electric field is going to drive the electrons up and down the wires and because the, the, the current is being driven up and down the wires it dissipates the energy and so the beam doesn't get through because all the energy goes into the electrical currents that get produced in the wire. So what chemists have done, you know, they've made very clever substances out of long molecules and again you don't need to know the chemistry but uh, they, they make a sort of like alternate single and double bonds along a chain and if you like the electrons can get very easily excited kind of if you like along the chain direction but the, the, they can't jump across this is a, a sort of co uh, covalently bonded material they can't they can't jump this way that doesn't happen they're stuck in the molecule but along the rod log long sort of rod like molecules they can jump 
So if you make a substance which is kind of the molecular equivalent of a grid like this, if you like, sort of, do, you know, we get down to the, 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 the light wavelengths and electrons responding to uh, light oscillations, then you can get easily materials called Polaroid, and, and which have this property that the excitations, ironically, the axis of polarization is precisely the molecules are in the opposite sense. It's the axis of polarization is the one that lets the uh, lets the excitations pass through. So, uh, in fact, now things you know it's the the way things go historically. Actually, you, you, you now do things the other way around. Because we've got what are called polarizing filters, in other words, materials that will only let one, one uh, axis of polarization through them, um, you've got to uh, a very nice way of measuring Brewster's angle. You kind of do it the other way around. You have an unpolarized source, and then you, you, you shine it on a surface. You, you have your polarizing filter, and that will only let through one particular orientation, and you wait until you get no, you turn the polarizing filter. At the angle where you get no reflection is now then Brewster's angle, and that's a very, very accurate way of measuring the refractive index, because if you're going from air, and then obviously um, you're, uh, you measure the angle accurately, you get N2. So you get the refractive index uh, of, the, of the medium. So again, I just make a, 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 a quick note on that. So let's. Uh, going to be. I'll, I'll probably, because of Sarah giving that little talk, have to carry the polarizer. I, I've been planning to finish the optics part today, but uh, rather than rush it, I'll probably finish it uh, on Monday. So um, at theta b the reflected beam is linearly polarised. So that's one way of producing polarised light from an unpolarised source. Of course, you know, like in the, in, in the 20th century, people invented lasers and we can produce completely polarised beams from the outset with, with a laser source, but... Um, the laser was only invented about 50 years ago, so this was uh, uh, the only method for a long time. Um, the more usual way of producing linearly polarized light is by passing unpolarized light through a sheet of Polaroid. And that's uh, And again, I'm not going, of course, to go into the, the details. I've tried just to sketch. It's not a magic property. It's precisely that you've got molecules where the electrons can be excited along a chain but can't jump from one chain to the other, and that acts like a, effectively like a grid of wires would to um, a long wavelength electromagnetic wave, and that's illustrated very schematically in figure uh, 88 of the course handout. So we've done now almost everything on uh, linearly polarized light, and what figure 90 is showing is an extreme... Again, now we're looking straight down the beam or, or straight into the beam. And what will happen if we have different combinations? Remember, the, in this diagram, the wave is propagating in the Z direction, which is coming out of the view graph. And of course, we could have our electric field, if the electric field's coming towards you, the electric field vector can be this way, it can be this way, it can be any angle in between. And that's exactly what's uh, illustrated here. And uh, of course, if EY is 1 and EX is 0, you've got linear polarization on the y axis. It, and 
these are just very simple superpositions. So here, EY is 1, EX is a half. You get this polar resultant polarization. If they're both equal to 1, of course, this angle becomes 45 degrees. That's completely trivial. However, this is assuming that the X and Y vibrations are in phase with each other. This is specifically in phase. So in other words, you're kind of considering the situation where the oscillations, they're at different angles to each other, but they're in phase. So we can just add them up in this very simplistic vector way. So that's the superposition in phase. That's the, again, I, as usual, lost all my view graph pens as I go along. I'm sure I had one here earlier. Um, that uh, the crucial thing to take away from this diagram is that these things are in phase. So in that case, you get exactly linearly polarised light. However, they don't have to be in phase with each other, the vibrations. So the figure 91 is the more important one. And uh, we will, uh, as I say, I'll come to the details next time because I don't want to rush it. This is called left circularly polarised light, and this is called right circularly polarised light. And linearly polarised light is a very, very special case, and so is the circularly polarised light. The general case is what's called elliptical polarisation. Now, what's being visualised here is probably easier to see with... Um, a picture more of this type. So first, what is happening now is that the electric, the electric field vector is oscillating, but its plane is... is, is so what the whole wave looks like, again, we first of all remember, of course, that there is always a, a magnetic field that's always perpendicular at any instant, but we'll forget that in our representation is the electric field vector, you can see, is tracing out a circle. The, what, what is actually happening is that this represents a wavelength. If you look at the whole, remember the end-on view sometimes obscures some of the, the physics of it. The electric field vector is going around the clock, but the wave is proceeding along. So the tip of the electric field vector is actually tracing out for circular light, either a right circular helix or a left circular helix. Now, I don't know, uh, it, when I was uh, at, at school, which was quite a while ago, we used to call these things Lissajous figures, and you can actually see them on an oscilloscope. If, uh, if you, if you want to pop into the lab, it's trivial to set up on any oscilloscope what's being done here. All you do is that you have uh, an AC circuit across your, uh, if you like, Y direction of your screen. And of course, this is at 50 hertz. The light, wave, uh, the light frequencies are many, many, many orders of magnitude higher, but it's the same pattern. And then if you, so we control, if you like, putting in an AC current to these plates. And if we just did that, well, the electron, the, you know, is just attracted up and down, and you see it on the cathode ray screen, you just see a line. But also, with an oscilloscope, we control AC to this pair of plates, and if we switch that one off, we could likewise, with this pair of plates now, my pl oscillating at 50 hertz, my plus minus, the electron would just oscillate in one sense. Now, if you look at figure, this figure, it is precisely what I mean about the in phase. Of course, I could choose this one to be exactly in phase with this one. I'm controlling when I, I send my AC current. I control my time T is equal to zero. And if I set those two things in phase, I will just see a lot of boring straight lines on the screen because they're in phase with each other, and we just get this linear superposition at each moment. The much more interesting thing is that I fire my AC to this circuit at a phase difference to this circuit, and in particular, 
if I have exactly a quarter of a wavelength in between them, we'll come back, um, there's a very clever uh, thing called a, circ a quarter wave plate to make um, polar circularly polarised light out of linearly polarised light. But you can, if you fire them exactly where one is the cosine, if this one is, let's say, the sine, and then the next one is the cosine, and we get them exactly a quarter of a wavelength out of phase, then what you see on the screen is a circle. So these are, you can actually visualise these things very easily, or you know, type into Google Lissajous figures. The, what, of course, the oscillations in light are extremely rapid compared with AC circuits, but it's exactly the same principle. You're making things oscillate. Your electric field vector is, in this sense and in this sense, combined. When they're to, in phase together, you always just get a straight line. But if you delay one relative to another, well, you know perfectly well, if this one is sine omega t, yeah, and this one is cos omega t, and they've got the same amplitude, well, we're going to have a squared into sine squared omega t plus cos squared omega t. You can, you can just see that you're, you're going to trace out a circle. But anyway, um, we'll, we'll re it's gone far too. We'll revisit that. I have covered enough for all the coursework. We'll finish polarisation uh, on Monday and develop that a bit further.